Hi, everyone. I am Allie Katz. I'm the program coordinator at the Kelly Writers House, and I want to welcome you to this virtual event uh, from Idea to Book. Uh, a couple things before we get started. Uh, we will be sharing some stuff in the chat, so you should feel free to participate in the chat. Uh, if you have questions at any point, you can ask them, and we'll get the questions from the YouTube to this conversation um, so that Jennifer and Waiki can answer your questions. Uh, we'll also be sharing like the guest book and links to the book, um, Waiki's book. So definitely stay tuned. Also, like and subscribe. Uh, we are on YouTube. Uh, and you can keep aware of all the cool programs coming through the Writer's House. Um, so this program was scheduled for, for last spring. We're incredibly excited to have it here now <laughs> in some in some form um, and to make it accessible to everybody because uh, I, I think there are very few things as interesting as figuring out how you get from the concept of a book to a physical book that you see in bookstores and it's um, you know not just one person laboring all by themselves uh, in a room although I bet there is a good deal of that too. Um, so thank you very much to, to Waiki Wing for bringing that to us. Um, and this is part of uh, Waiki's Beltran Award. Um, and I want to thank Lena and John Paul Beltran for this. Uh, it allows, it's an award that supports teachers who go beyond teaching to like real rich mentorship, the kind of mentorship that we, we love at the Writer's House uh, where teachers engage with students and work on projects and inspire them um, and make sort of the writing life real. Um, so thank you, Waiki, for doing all the things that got you to the point where you won uh, this Beltran Award and were able to put on this project. Um, and for anyone who is listening and doesn't know, uh, Waiki is the author of Chemistry, which is one of my favorite books of 2017. I know that's specific. That's when the book came out. Uh, it's really, really awesome. Uh, and everyone should read it. You're going to hear a lot about the process behind that. Uh, she was the Craven Writer in Residence of Penn. Uh, she's the recipient of the 2018 Penn Hemingway uh, Whiting Award, National Book Foundation 535. She's been in all kinds of publications. Uh, and she lives in New York and teaches at Pen. Um, she's in conversation today with her editor, uh, Jennifer Cordilla, who is a writer, freelance editor, and wellness teacher who's acquired and edited a range of fiction and, and nonfiction for NOP, NOP, sorry, and The Experiment, uh, and now supports literary arts as an independent ghostwriter, which I'm super interested in, uh, collaborator and publishing consultant. Uh, she's a co-author of a cookbook that's coming out soon uh, called Root and Nourish, an herbal cookbook for women's wellness uh, with Abby Rodriguez, and she lives in Brooklyn, although I hear that she is currently in New Jersey. Um, so without further ado, Waiki and Jennifer. Thank you, Allie, um, and thanks for joining us. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of intro to how I met Jennifer and what she's been up to. Um, Jennifer probably knows publishing so well because she's been she's the writer she's been the editor she's sort of seen everything in publishing um whereas writers such as myself kind of only see one side and i actually think editors sort of like that because they don't actually want to make the writer nervous um and i'm very grateful for what jennifer did for me about chemistry because it was my first book i didn't know that much about publishing i didn't know that much about what went into making a book um and so when I started writing this book, um, I was still a grad student at Boston University. I was doing their MFA in fiction. Their program is a year and a half, if you sort of include summer months. Um, and it's a pretty intensive program. And at the end of that program, um, each student was encouraged and pretty much required to write a thesis. Um, and I just knew that um, this was kind of my last opportunity for my mentors and my teachers who I admired to read my work. Um, so at that point, I kind of said, okay, Waiki, figure it out. Um, and sort of in like four, five months, I put kind of the really beginning rough drafts of chemistry together. Um, and it wasn't finished, obviously, in terms of polishing and editing, but I sort of had a beginning and an end. Um, and I turned that into my mentor, my thesis advisor, Shafe, who goes by the pen name Hajin. Um, and I actually did the program because I really wanted to work with Hajin 
um, whose books I've read um, in college, and Sigrid Nunez, whose books I'd also read. Um, she recently came out with a book, What Are You Going Through? She wrote The Friend, Hajin wrote Waiting. These are all sort of books that um, kind of spoke to me when I was you know, reading them. So I wanted to work with those two um, particularly, and they had read the thesis. Um, and what had happened was kind of a stroke of luck just from the writer side, um, I ended up um, being introduced to Ha Jin's editor, um, Luanne Walters, who worked, um, she's at, is she at, what did she say, at Pantheon? She's at Vintage. She's at Vintage, okay. So- and not, but mo mostly Vintage. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I didn't know how sort of that worked. And then it kind of went off into the ether for like a couple months. And then I got an email from Jennifer um, and, um, we had a great phone call and that's sort of how the relationship started. I felt like I knew you through email and phone calls before I actually met you, right? Yeah, and that's um, that's actually often the case for a lot of writers and, um, you know, throughout time, well before we had all these wonderful technologies that bring us together and now everyone's connecting via video, which is even better, but um, writers and editors would not ever meet you know, or they would meet once, maybe if they, especially if they lived in different parts of the country or even different parts of the world. So um, the way that we came together, um, you said it was a stroke of luck for you, but it was very much a stroke of luck for me as well. At the time, I was a young editor at Knopf, um, which is a very storied and um, vastly uh, reputable publisher. Um, and I was working my way to um, building a list of my own, um, which like getting published as an author is not easy for editors either. So being able to find that combination of um, a book that works for your house um, and that speaks to your personal list and then you could get um, support from, from the rest of your team is not something that happens very easily. Um, so the, the kind of trail that goes along through um, the writing process on the author's side of, of getting the book in somebody's hands, like a real person's hands, not just a, an inbox or a mailbox um, back in the old days, but being able to um, find someone who will actually read your book and then be able to get that book read by hires up um, who can make decisions about whether or not they will publish it um, is, is something that is very serendipitous. But like many of the best things that happen, at least in my life, um, this, uh, this circumstance was quite simple. Um, like Wakey was saying, um, Luann got her manuscript from Ha Jin and um, having that recommendation, of course, made us all um, perk up. And then she asked me if I would be interested in working with Wiki, and I loved the book immediately. And then um, the best part of the story, I think, is that um, on that first call that we had, we actually realized that we um, were in the same year um, in, a, in undergrad, the same college, um, but we didn't know each other because Wiki, of course, was studying science and I was studying English and we were in different buildings most of the time. <laughs> so, um, coming upon that, it just felt like very um, meant to be. So it was a great way of connecting to a writer to have, you know, her first book published, my first book, uh, first book published. And so it was a very special, um, special pairing. So can you, can you actually talk a little bit about what you just said about the list? Because when you had actually first talked to me about that, I actually had no idea what the, what the list was, because, you mm -hmm. know, every writer is just sort of writing their own book, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, once I met Joy, my agent, and, you know, now with you and with Robin, it's always, you know, they mentioned the list. <laughs> and I'm, I, before I was actually really just curious what that was. Um, can you kind of explain that or sort of? Yeah, that? sure. So an editor's list or an agent's list or even a, publishing or a publisher's list, the publishing house, um, I like to think of it as um, their personal bookshelf, um, which is actually um, not just a metaphor, it's it's literal because once you start editing books or working with, with writers in any official capacity, um, you know, you have a bookshelf, just like um, many of us have in the background of our Zooms now um, that houses all of your books. And it's very much a personal reflection of your taste and interest um, that, um, on the agenting side can be quite broad um, because agents have a little bit more uh, free reign over what kind of projects they take on. At a publishing house on the editorial side, the, uh, the list can be a little bit more restrictive in the sense that certain houses have a certain style um, 
or you might be an editor um, who works on a certain kind of book that's more um, more to the point of if you're a nonfiction editor or nonfiction publisher. Um, so in addition to working at Knopf, I also worked at um, an independent press called The Experiment, where we published only nonfiction. Um, and a lot of it was very focused around science and health um, and that kind of subject. And so my uh, niche within that niche was working on cookbooks. So I only really worked on cook, cookbooks and food books while I was there, which you know was was very different from working on novels, of course. So there was that element to it. But even within that, you know, there were po projects where if I was interested in a topic, um, it perhaps wasn't what was on my quote unquote list. So it might go to another editor at that house or just to another house entirely because we didn't publish that kind of book. So that's where the, the list comes into play. So just because um, you, you connect with an editor who perhaps personally enjoys the book um, and like would read it as a, as a reader, doesn't necessarily mean that they will acquire the book because um, it might not align with what they're working to publish. So that's where the list comes into play. Mm -hmm. And sort of every editor kind of, you know, no writer really knows that much about the editor's list because what's so great about I felt you know the editor writer relationship is when you're talking to your editor it kind of just feels like they're editing your book <laughs> well, that's the goal I'm glad that it worked yeah. out <laughs> right. so when I was talking to Jennifer now you know when I talk when I talk to other editors it just feels like you're their only person but that that's obviously not true because lists can get very long and very big um and Jennifer you're you're also ghostwriting so you know you have a lot on your plate but I think a great editor at least I felt a great relationship that we had was it just felt like when I was speaking to you about the book over the phone for edits, it, it just felt like it was, there's was so much time to deal with all the fixes that we needed to do. Um, with, with chemistry, you know, I'd given you the book kind of completed and usually that is the advice that most teachers will say at the beginning for your first book. I think you kind of want the finished, I think mostly for fiction, nonfiction is slightly mm -hmm. different because you need to do a proposal. Yes. Um, but for fiction, you kind of need the entire product first. Um, because Hodgin said this as well, he sort of he sort of said a publishing house wants to make sure that you as an author, you're reliable. Yes. <laughs> um, and I didn't really quite understand that because it felt like a strange thing to say. But I think you actually have, a, you know, when we had a conversation, you sort of mentioned something about kind of what an editor, what an editor is also looking for other than the book. Yes, so the when it comes to fiction and sending in a, a submission for fiction, um, you're absolutely right that having a full manuscript is ideal because um, when, when you're thinking about, you know, are we going to want to sell this book, you kind of want to know what's going to happen <laughs> and you want to know that, you know, what is the ending, um, even if that's not um, the if, if it's not a plot driven book or that's not necessarily the the best um the best aspect of things but it is something that um you know you want to know how is this book how am i going to sell it how am i going to share it with people um what is my overall kind of pitch going to be how am i going to compare it to other books um on the nonfiction side like you said it's not as important to have a complete manuscript because sometimes um, oftentimes, actually, things change in the process of research. Um, and so you might go in and say, um, you know, I want to investigate this topic or speak to these people. And then when you go do that, like they tell you a different story than you were expecting. And so you have to kind of adjust. Um, but that's built in a little bit into the nature of a, a nonfiction project. And oftentimes, um, hopefully, the, the author has a, a good enough sense that they will find the information that they're, they say they're going to find, um, or they, you know, they have enough things already lined up that you, you know, the end of the story more or less. Um, but fiction, because um, the writing process in and of itself, um, and I've never really, really written long form fiction, I, you know, dabbled in short stories and things like that in, in my studies. Um, but the, the writing process and the creative process um, when writing a novel is so dynamic, um, as, as you know, and all of you watching know, um, who are writers, that the, 
you have to kind of go through that before you can expect someone to give you feedback. Um, otherwise, it's it's just going to kind of go around in circles and it can kind of get in the way, I think, of a writer's process to interject too early and say, oh, like, I think you should make this happen instead. Whereas some, you know, some writers, um, when they're approaching fiction or nonfiction, like they use outlines and have like everything kind of laid out before they get to the end. Others are much more organic and they, um, you know, they don't know where, where the characters are going to go, where the plot is going to go or what's going to happen in chapter three after chapter two. So um, that process is very unique. And I don't think that an editor um, wants to interrupt that process. So that's why I think having the, the full manuscript is, is really useful um, on the, on the side of fiction, but I feel like I'm not quite answering your question. Was there something else, another part of that, that you wanted to you elaborate on? Um, before was that generally when we were talking on the phone that an editor sort of is also interested in kind of lo lo oh, yes. activity. Yeah. Yes. So, um, I think always, but especially now, given our environment um, where a lot of what sells a book is not just the book itself, but the author. Um, and we are so personally engaged um, on social media and online, um, which has pros and cons, as we all know. But um, being able to know that the author has um, a sense of um, literary citizenship is the, is the phrase that one of my colleagues likes to use a lot, that they are engaged in, in a writing community. Um, they have a sense of, of fellow writers who they can connect with um, or some kind of, um, I hate to use this word, but platform that you can kind of um, build on. Um, a publishing house um, wants to always make an investment in the writer's career. That's one of the kind of metrics that we look at whenever someone is acquiring a book. Um, is this writer going to write just one book? Um, is this the only story they have in them? Or are they interested in having a career as a writer? And that's not to say that if you just have one book or one story, that's a bad thing because um, that might just be the case. Um, but it's something that um, as a writer, you want to ask yourself going into the process. Do I want to do this for multiple iterations. Um, is, is there a, a drive in me? Is there a, um, a spark where I feel like my creative uh, potential is going to continue after this one book? Or is it something that's um, that I've just been working on for whatever reason? And after that, I'm like burnt out and done with it. Um, that's is that, not that, is that common that when you acquire a first book that sort of it never kind of there's no like sort of follow-up in that way it could be it really depends on the writer um sometimes you know life happens too um i know a lot of people um who you know they have every intention of continuing to write but their family circumstances change or they need to move or they might have um you know another a spark and another interest um that takes them off course i've actually had um, writers who were almost in the reverse situation of, from you, Wiki, where, you know, they started off writing and then they wound up like going to medical school and then, you know, <laughs> medical school happened and then they became doctors and it's like, not that they didn't want to keep writing, but they just didn't have time. So, um, so that's the kind of thing that, that can change anyone's course, of, course of their career. Um, and, and even if that is the case where, you know, that, you know, you just have, you're not looking that far ahead for yourself. Um, that's okay. Like, it doesn't mean that you should stop and like give it up. Um, but just have that in the back of your head when you're, when you're thinking of, um, pitching yourself to people, do you already know that, oh yes, I have another novel that's on the back burner. I have a bunch of stories that I want to get published. Um, or I've really just been working on this and, um, this is all I have for now. I can't predict in the future what's going to happen. Um, and be honest with your agent or your editor about that so that they they know like what kind of relationship am i getting into it's always good to be honest in relationships i think and really? and as you as you mentioned wiki i think one of the things that's perhaps underestimated about the publishing process is just how relationship uh heavy it is um yeah. it's really much 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 less about the kind of 
details of what we're doing on the page um, because my my um, my first boss, um, Robin Desser, who is who is now Wiki's editor, um, she and I, when we were working together on edits, we would often have these moments where we would make the same exact change to a sentence or ask the same question, and we would have this little inside joke. We were where we would say it was science because editing is often very much a science. You know, you go through and it's like, well, this this just isn't right, or like this word isn't right, or this needs to be moved. No, actually, for this new second book, I'm working with your replacement, Cleo, I sort of feel like I'm in, you know, the Devil Wears Prada. <laughs> I, made joke, I made that joke and Robin thought that was funny. So now that's just this joke where it's like, it's like Jennifer, but now it's Cleo. And <laughs> the new well, joke. I know Cleo, she's very good. So very good hands. Yeah. Um, so there are a couple of questions that I thought we'll just like tackle because then it kind of gets fast, us back into sort of the editing process a little bit. One was about, um, did anybody unofficially edit my book? before Jennifer. Um, I'm a pretty, I'm a generally a pretty good editor of my own work with chemistry because it had been completed. Um, it, would already, it had gone through the edits of my MFA cohort. They had all read it. I had some good friends who were reading it. Um, Hajin read it, Sigurd read it. They both gave some feedback in terms of conversation. Um, but what I was really appreciative of is that Joy, my agent, didn't do crazy, didn't edit, which I actually think is kind of uncommon now since edit, agents actually do quite a bit of editing. Um, and it was sort of just like me and Jennifer working on this book, which was actually really great. Um, that, you know, she read the entire thing and you gave me your notes, which at the time really freaked me out because they were really long. They were sort of like five pages, single spaced, what is it like size 10 font or something that you use? I'm pretty sure it was size 12 font, okay. but it was, it was a detailed it felt, letter. It yes. felt daunting. It felt daunting. I read it and I was like, oh my God, I just need to start over, which is not the case um, is what I've realized. Um, but same with Robin. I think it's like very similar that every time I give her a section, she kind of gives back these notes that are so detailed, but actually the fixes are much shorter than the notes. It's sort of what you end up realizing. Um, so you end up getting those notes and that's how the process goes. Um, I guess for, 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 and then there's sort of deadlines, but the deadlines are actually, this is a question of does having an external source of deadlines help or hurt the process. Um, for me, I, I feel like in the, I actually never got any huge hard deadlines from you. You sort of said, can you just get this done in kind of a, you know, a couple weeks or something like that. And I would just turn it into you in a couple weeks and that yeah. was you know yeah well part of the thing with deadlines is that they're very um they can be very flexible but they can also not be um so it really depends on the nature of the book that you're working on and the um the publisher's own timeline with fiction it's a little bit it tends to be a little bit more fluid because um oftentimes a fiction title is not very timely or like tied to some kind of calendar event where it's like this book needs to come out now because otherwise it won't make sense in the kind of public discourse. Mm -hmm. um, nonfiction can be much more um, weighted on deadlines in that respect, um, as I'm sure everybody understands, um, especially with some of the most recent books that have come out where it's like talking about something that's pertinent um, immediately right now. Mm -hmm. So um, when it comes to the deadlines, we at Knopf, at least, we generally tended to have very generous um, schedules for things. Um, at the experiment at the other publishing house where I worked, sometimes the deadlines and the schedules were not as generous. And so things really needed to stay on task, especially in the case of certain of the cookbooks that I was working on, where they were um, all color, as you know, most cookbooks are. And that required the books being printed overseas. And so that always added like six weeks of extra time before the um, the book would be able to even get um, back to the United States after it was printed. So when that happens, it's kind of like, um, you need to kind of play play a little bit of uh, roulette with, with how things are gonna be turned in. But I will say too that, you know, Wakey, you were always very good about turning things in when I asked you to. So not all authors are like that in the case of like, I asked you, can you hand this back in a month? And it's like, 
five months later and I haven't heard from them. And so those four months, you know, you need to account for somewhere. So yeah. when we, whenever we approach uh, a new writer, you sometimes have to kind of give yourself a bit of padding so that you, until you know how to, how they work and like what to expect on how, what, what they're doing. Our editorial process was also, I think on the lighter side of things. Um, I've worked um, with writers on books for years um, doing like, you know, those five, sometimes much longer page editorial letters. For well, years. no, I, I, um, I'm going through that now. So like, I yeah. feel like now I'm thinking about chemistry. I'm like, wow, that was, that was kind of a breeze. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, that's the kind of thing where um, you never quite know how long something is going to take. And hopefully, you know, the publisher, if it, do, if it does wind up taking longer, the publisher is um, forgiving and flexible because they, um, you know, they want the book to be, everybody wants the book to be the best that they, the best that it can be. So if we don't have to rush, there's really no need to rush. Yeah, no, I, I think um, with the, well, you know, the first book I thought, I, it was, it, it kind of felt like pure luck that um, I had gotten in contact with you. I had some great teachers that I was able to kind of, you know, um, work with and mentor. And then we had a really pretty straightforward editorial process. Not that the second book's editorial process is diff, it, it's, it's just longer because the second book is always just longer. Or it's, it takes longer. Um, and then we had to move house and things like that. But um, it, I also remember, Wakey, that you had yeah. been working on that book for a long time. Um, yeah, I, I was your, I was your thesis. So that's just, it kind of like, if you go back to that starting point, um, you still have all of that time in which you were, you know, you were working on it, but you just didn't have somebody um, intervening. Right, which is, well, now it's like with the second book, because I, I didn't, I did turn in a whole thing, but we were now editing sort of in chunks and it's just like a completely different process. But maybe the third book will be even harder. So like I'm just sort of on the trajectory of it's just gonna get more and more impossible until I quit, I guess. Maybe that's that's the career of the writer. Um, yeah. um so I'm gonna get up just a second to turn on the light okay, here. Yeah, no worries, like no in the dark. Um I'll just take this time to sort of answer um, questions that are more for me. Um, one question from Aaron, how much do you think about the potential audience while writing? And does the community or circle of editors affect your writing process? Um, no, I personally don't actually think about my audience at all. I just think about, unfortunately, myself. It's actually somewhat selfish. Um, I think about what I want to write, what I want to read, uh, how I want to sound on the page, and then I sort of kind of do that. Um, fiction, at least in my experience, writing short stories, writing novels have always kind of been very singular. I think nonfiction is slightly different, right? Like Jennifer, with your cookbook and your work, you're thinking actually about an audience, you know? So that's slightly different compared to fiction. Um, I, think, I think too that, you know, you're saying that you're not, um, you're not thinking about a reader. However, you know, you are a reader. Um, I'm a reader. You know, yeah. You're not just, you're not just, not in the sense of just you're reading your own book, but you are a reader in the sense that you have read many stories and you know what stories you like and you're going to write a story that's some somehow picking up on some elements of stories that you've liked in the past right and something that i've always taken away from everything that i've read and edited in a professional capacity or even a personal capacity is that somebody's going to like this mm -hmm. i've never encountered a story where it was universally disliked <laughs> um, you know, if it's, if it's something that maybe like fewer people like, then it ha probably is not being published. But I think, you know, even, you know, think about books that are very popular that have run, won awards that maybe you don't personally like. It's like, well, somebody obviously liked this. So I, I think every story has somebody for it. And there's that implicit reader, even if it's just yourself and the kind of chorus of readers who are kind of um, always with you whenever you're reading a story. Um, but absolutely on, on the nonfiction side, it, you are so much more conscious of your audience. I've, um, I'm writing a cookbook right now and, you know, we have a very, um, 
a very specific reader in mind who has specific needs and, and desires for why they would pick up this book. I've also, as a ghostwriter, um, worked on other nonfiction where um, there's a very targeted audience, a, a certain demographic of people from a certain industry or people who are outside of a certain industry. Um, you know, there's an educational quality to nonfiction that um, you have to identify who is this person I'm trying to educate on this topic and why do I think they need to be educated on this topic? Um, so that's something to keep in mind, but I wouldn't let it um, kind of dampen the writing process overall, um, even if you're writing nonfiction, because the same, the same idea applies um, that we just spoke of that somebody, if you find something interesting, um, somebody else is gonna find it interesting. And if you can find any sort of research that would back up your, your topic, then you already know that like that person found it interesting enough to like do whatever research they did on it. So there's, I think there's more, um, there's more emphasis placed on the audience on the kind of sales side of things, which is, is very important to the sales and marketing, but, um, I actually know nothing about. To yeah. this <laughs> well, no one does really. <laughs> you, you don't know anything about that. <laughs> I mean, I, I observed it and participated in it, but um, the the way that sales and marketing works is um, is not an exact science, unfortunately. Um, but it's something that we we pretend to have a sense of uh, awareness of, um, and there are numbers that we that we look at, but you really can't predict what is going to take off. Um, I don't think any book that has really um, overwhelmed the cultural zeitgeist um or the readership like the, anyone really knew like this is going to happen definitively um you know things just happen or they don't happen or on the on the flip side of things you know you could project that something is going to be a really big hit um based on a number of different things and then maybe it doesn't happen for some reason and everyone's scratching their head and so um a lot of publishing is um, very, very conscious, like risk calculation on everybody's part, but that's what makes it fun, to be honest. <laughs> and yeah. and that's what makes it uh, the- it's adventure. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think my, my, my general, since, you know, I'm seeing some questions about sort of agents, I, this was a question I was thinking about for a while in that, in creating a book, so the writing, you know, the writer does, right? Um, the writer's trying to write this book and the editor edits it. Um, but the agent most of the time is selling it. For us, it was slightly different. Like I actually felt like our path was slightly untraditional in terms yes. of you saw the manuscript first before I even had an agent. Um, but most of the time you're probably acquiring through agents, right? Correct. So how does that conversation go um, in terms of, you know, because then we weren't connected directly, right? Correct. Um, so that path is quite unconventional um, nowadays. However, the normal, quote unquote, normal path um, when you're working with a traditional publisher, um, meaning uh, a publisher with a publishing house um, that has sales team, marketing team, editorial team, design team, all those different things. Um, the the normal trajectory is the author will secure an agent a representation from a, a literary agent and that is um it's kind of like a two-stage process of um winning people over so in the same way that you have to find somebody who likes your work and feels like they can represent it um from an editor um, first you need to get that with an agent because the agent then needs to say i have enough confidence that i think i could sell this book and I'm going, and I also know the people who I can sell it to. Um, that's one of the best um, parts of having an agent is because they have the connections to the people who they know, who who's the the editors whose lists they think this book will fit on, um, the publishing houses that they think um, will take it, and they can co connect you directly to those individuals. Um, agents are also useful for a number of other things. You know, they help you with all of the legal stuff. They make sure that your rights are retained. Um, 
They are also a very nice liaison um, with the publishing house if you have to have awkward conversations about the cover or the title or things like that, um, or anything really. Um, like the agent is like an advocate for you. Exactly, yes. But I, I, what I think worked really well with us is you did the editing and then my agent sort of did everything else and I did the writing. Mm -hmm. um, I think for, you know, right now I have a lot of friends who are kind of finding agents or have found agents. And one thing is that there are certain agents who edit so much that I almost yes. think it's sort of strange. And I don't know if you've seen that. Yes, um, I have seen that and it's, it's not a bad thing. Um, yeah. What I... What I always try to do in my mind um, when I when I was approaching fiction or nonfiction um, as an editor is to keep in mind how much of that had already happened because likely the author had done their own editing and like whether it's through a program or colleagues or just themselves um, and then if they also worked extensively with an agent then they might be reaching that kind of burnout peak of like, I can't take any more edits. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. if that's, that's the case. Gone through, she's like now in round four with her agent. And I just think yeah. that's a little ridiculous because then by the time you get to editorial, it's because you have the edits and then you have first pass and then you have second pass. You have to look at the galley. It, it's honestly going to feel so endless and you have to be in the book for, for years. You know, you have yes. to be so committed. Yes. And that, um, that I've, definitely witnessed. Um, I think the the goal of having that many rounds of edits with an agent is to have fewer rounds with an editor. <laughs> so that's uh, hopefully trying to, to kind of streamline the process somewhat. However, um, that's not always a guarantee. And so um, <laughs> we do all work. of that work. And, and then, you know, you also have to think, you know, if the book needed this much work, yeah, um, then it's a little scary. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> not to say that like your friend I don't I don't know your friend or well she's a YA. <laughs> no YA I think is actually very particular oh yes well YA yeah. has like a very strict template and she <laughs> was in my MFA cohort so she was literary fiction right and then to learn she YA, had to learn yes yeah so that was like kind of a shock to her yes um and yeah. also with that you know if she's writing YA um you know she might also be you know that's also very audience driven to the point we were talking about earlier like That's you need to write a book that will yeah yeah so you yeah. need to do that um so i wouldn't that that then to me doesn't sound like it's like crazy um but yeah lots of editing happens all the time right. no it, it is kind of like a marriage you, you and your agent um mm -hmm. my agent joy is like very she's very nurturing she actually never sends me any edits sometimes i'm like maybe we should edit this <laughs> <laughs> um, because now at this point I'm sort of like I either send it to Robin or my friends or you and I don't that's it right like the list is sort of like kind of short um so otherwise I just edit my own stuff but um yeah that that kind of like triangle is really important and having a good relationship with your agent and to what we were speaking of earlier about like the the writing life and the writing career an agent is really your your first stop for that as well, because the agent, your agent wants to make an investment in somebody who's going to continue to write um, so that they can continue to represent them. So your agent, you want to be on board with them for not only this project, but for your entire, you know, literary career. And that might and will likely evolve over time. So you want to have somebody who is maybe not so hung up on the actual words on the page, but who likes you as a person, who you feel comfortable talking to and like maybe crying with or, you know, being really <laughs> happy with. Like you want to have somebody who you could feel you can be open with and and have good and hard conversations and know that they're going to stand by you or if, even if they don't agree with you, perhaps they can help show you um, show you that what you're not seeing or help you understand the circumstance in a little bit of a clearer way um, so that your best interests are still kept, but is also in the best interest of the book. Because sometimes, uh, oftentimes, um, and having just had a few of these moments myself, um, you know, <laughs> you can be a little bit too close to your book and you There's just think, oh my God, how can they do this? Yeah. And they're like, it's okay. <laughs> now, now know what it's like to get edits. It's yes. 
you sort of need to kind of like pour yourself a glass of wine, take some time away from it. And then usually the editor is right. I mean, always you are right. I think, you know, what was kind of an enlightening moment with editing was like, you were always right about what did not work, but then it was up to me to kind of figure out how to make it better, you know? Yeah. Like, you just try, you just try different things until you're like, oh, okay, that, that works, you know, right. but you can't tell me what to do in terms of like, what's going to make it work. And that's also, from my perspective, that was always the best part of editing is that I could say something to a writer. Um, and it was often, uh, most of my edits and still to this day are more questions than like, do this because uh, I don't, I can't tell you what to do, number one, but also you know your book and you are the you are the creator. I am not the creator in this case. So I don't want to be imposing a structure or a path that doesn't feel right to you. And sometimes, you know, people would come up with like the best stuff that, you know, neither of us ever predicted. And certainly I never would have expected from the question that I asked or the comment that I made. But those moments of kind of opening um into some new realm um were always so so magical and very uh satisfying well, the way that you placed it that helped me orient it because i'm so like stem trained is that i think one, at one point and you said this and robin says this is it's a problem like that i'm just interested in seeing how you're going to solve right and that's actually very encouraging because it's sort of like they, they kind of you list out the problems an editor always sees the problems better than the writer, but the writer generally knows more about the story, right? Mm -hmm. So then um, it's kind of a problem solving pathway. Um, so I also find that um, in a lot of conversations that I've had with writers post editorial, the things that an editor will point out are often things that the writer already knew were problematic and maybe they just couldn't figure out how to fix it or they were like, I'm going to give up. Maybe they won't and, notice. Right. Or <laughs> someone else will tell me what to do. So when you have somebody yeah. telling you, it's like, okay, I guess I have to fix this now. Um, and sometimes, you know, then the editor can give you some advice or direction or like, you know, show you something that you didn't think of before, but it's never really something that is completely out of the blue, mm -hmm. in my experience, at least. Very true. It's very true. Um, you know, I think maybe now I'll turn to some of the questions about yes. kind of the process. Um, I'll talk, I'll answer sort of the questions that I'm starting to see about just the idea part sure. prior to publishing. And then you can kind of take over the publishing ones. Um, um, in terms of one of the questions was about, well, first of all, um, how did you decide that an MFA was right for you? And what did you pursue? And at what time in your career did you feel like it was the right time? Um, there's never a right time. You kind of have to jump in and do it. I did my MFA concurrent. I don't think it was actually legal. Concurrent with my doctorate mm -hmm. in like epidemiology and biostatistics. Um, I did it because that was the only time that I could find to do it. So it was sort of pressure. Um, and I knew if I was going to embark on this writing career, I needed to write the book or kind of make something sort of have something to show for because I, you know, I didn't have a trust fund. I didn't have anything that was going to kind of like blow my sales for like 20 years. Um, so that was something I knew. I, it's just pure determination, sometimes a little bit of stupidity. Right. Um, so that was, I knew I wanted to do an MFA because I wanted to teach. Um, you don't need an MFA if you don't want to teach. You can kind of just write on your own without an MFA and publish. Um, one question was about in writing fiction, do you tend to plan out specific sections before you begin or do you write more naturally um i you know you mentioned that a lot of writers outline i wish i actually could outline i don't you encouraged me to outline i remember you saying that <laughs> yeah and you said wikey you need to write out a timeline and this is the exact thing that robin just recently told me to do like <laughs> a month ago <laughs> um she's like Wikey, you need to go through the timeline with me and i was like i'm having deja vu because i did this before <laughs> um but i i wish i outlined better i just I'm not a very good outliner. So it actually for me is a huge amount of trial and error. And I write a section, I delete a ton, right? And then, you know, what you see, like I, I usually don't have that much to show you sometimes because it's like I've deleted pretty much everything. Like if I had enough time, I'll end up deleting everything I write. Um, but it just takes so much trial and error. And that's just, it's an inefficient system, you know, for writing, I think. Um, editing is probably pretty efficient compared to writing. Uh, I don't 
know about that. Um, no. <laughs> but having done both, I, I don't think one is more efficient than the other by any means. Um, but on the point of outlining, just because this does come up quite a bit, um, I think that outlining is very helpful for a number of reasons. If it's not something that you're, you gravitate towards naturally in the creative moment, that's fine. Don't try to force yourself into creating lists of things if you, if you can't get into that headspace, but it is something useful to do um, kind of in hindsight when you've gone through the whole book and you need to understand what you've written. Um, outlining could then be a form of editing because then you go through and say, I said this here, like this much time has passed. They were related to this person. And now like, it just gives you a, a way to map out the book in a little bit more of a coherent way. So that when you do go into edit a little bit more uh, aggressively, perhaps you know for yourself what is happening um, and when it happened. I think if I'm remembering correctly, and if you know something better with you, please correct me. But I remember hearing stories about, um, you know, Charles Dickens and back in the day when they would publish things serially. Um, so he would write a chapter and then like it would be published in the magazine and then the next month would be another chapter. And so like his books, which are always like very long would be published over many years, over many months. But by the time he got to the end of the book, he forgot what happened in like <laughs> chapter two or three because he wrote it a year ago. And it was like, it was something that was being published serially. So that kind of thing can happen um, when you get caught up in the writing process and you just don't want that to happen. So if you can, if you can do that. <laughs> outliner. outliner. I feel like you're going to be, you're more of an outliner than I am probably. I, I tend to like outlines. However, having just worked on a book where we use a lot of outlines, the outlines were very loose. Um, you know, we had a very detailed outline. Um, this is for a nonfiction book that I was um, ghostwriting. And we had a very detailed outline. But then as you get into it, you kind of go down different avenues or you find that like, this is taking more time to explain than I thought or this is no longer really interesting, or like this part should actually go there. Um, when I write personally, I tend to be very associative. Um, and even I remember when I was like writing papers in college um, where an outline is perhaps a little bit more appropriate, I would kind of, I would do an outline in reverse where I would say like, okay, these are the things that I wanna say, like the big chunks, mm -hmm. and then kind of fill it in backwards. So the outline was, was really just a, a kind of framework that I could move things around within. And it, it made it feel like it was somewhat more structured, but I don't know if it really was any more structured than if you were to just go into a blind. <laughs> well, I usually know the first scene and then I know the second scene. Right. Then, right. then I build the third scene. And then if I have to take the first two scenes out, then I start with the third scene. So I, you know, and then I move things around, right? But usually then that's just connective tissue, but there's generally um, kind of like one, if I like the voice, I'll keep with the piece. I don't, it's not, it's never about what's going to happen, right? If I like mm -hmm. sort of how the writing sounds, I'm going to keep with the piece, whether it's cap, you know, and then that kind of pushes me forward. Um, there's some questions about, um, uh, maybe I can ask, ask, um, I can ask you, Jennifer can I ask you some of these questions. Yes. Sort of yes. Your questions are great. Everybody. I know. Yeah. Some of, are so, yeah. some of these are so great. Um, I think one question that kind of is sort of something that an editor can speak on. Well, first of all, one question is, um, how, how did you decide to become an editor? How, what inspired you to become an editor? Sure. So, um, well, I became an editor because I was really interested in literature and, and yeah. books and writing. But I didn't feel like I wanted to be a writer myself. Um, and in the process of my schooling and things like that, I always found the the revising process to be very enjoyable. And um, I had a lot of success with it. And I did it with my friends. And they seemed to benefit from it as well. And so I, I really kind of fell into it in that sense of I remember doing like a search at one point when I was you know applying for colleges. And I was like, what are jobs related to literature? And yeah. it was like, writer, and then, it, you know, publishing came up and I was like, oh, publishing. And 
I never really thought about it because, you know, books are just books and I never thought about how they became books. Um, but then I realized that there's a lot of people who go into it and I was like, well, I can do that. And the more that I learned about the editorial process, um, the more it became clear that that job is so much more than um, just editing words on a page. It's really everything that we've been talking about. It's being a, um, a psychotherapist for your writers. It's being um, a salesperson um, because you have to pitch um, these books to your colleagues in a way that um, you know has a lot of data and, and information backing it up. Um, you have to think like a marketer. Is this going to be something that I can share with people and get excited about sharing with it? Um, sometimes there's this image of um, editors up in there. What do they call it? Like your, you know, your ivory tower, um, just by yourself, you know, reading things with your your red pencil. Um, but editors have to be out in the world because otherwise they don't know what kinds of books people are reading. They don't know what writers are out there. They don't know the agents who will be able to sell them the books that they want to uh, eventually buy. Um, and they need to know like what is what is working, what's popular, what are other editors doing. So it's a very multifaceted um, job. That kind of brings to the second question and a couple of people ask about um, you know, now there's a rise of sort of speculative literature, realistic fiction, like fantasy, right? This kind of stuff versus literary fiction, which is what Kanoff and most houses are kind of like doing as well. But I think also every house has sort of speculative fiction and genre as well. Um, also the rise of like self-publishing, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the questions was, um, is the process change for like speculative fiction versus literary fiction or like memoir or pseudo memoir or something? Um, versus fantasy so like fantasy versus you know realistic speculative versus um literary and kind of how self-publishing plays a role into publishing now um sure so i'm not quite sure what facet of the question um this person is asking but the editorial process for any genre is is really the same um even if it's fiction versus nonfiction. and i always tell that to people when i'm working with them um, when I've been working as a freelance editor as well, that it's really all about telling a story, whether you're telling a, a made up story that's, you know, very close to your real life or something that's taking place on another planet or something that is, you know, drawing on data and research um, and is about politics or climate change or anything, you're, you're telling a story. Mm -hmm. And so the editorial process um, is going to be basically the same. And so will the, the agent process, the acquisition process, all of that will be the same. Yeah. Um, on the note of self-publishing, um, that's a kind of a whole other topic that we don't have a ton of time to get too deep into, but um, the, new, the new models for publishing are very diverse and pretty exciting actually for authors because it gives them different avenues for, for publishing their books in quite you know legitimate and fair ways that don't involve having to go through the whole um, agent editorial process, which can be quite um, time and energy taxing and even financially taxing. So mm -hmm. the, the kind of two other options that I'm aware of and have worked with people in are the straightforward self-publishing, which you know, started a few years ago as a very um, taboo sort of thing to do where you would, you know, upload your Word document to Amazon and like print out books. And that just seemed like, you know, a vanity project or like it wasn't um, really doing anything and you could sell your book for $1.99 and like anyone would just buy it. And so often, you know, when that trend started happening, that happened a lot and people would come to us um, on the publishing side and say, oh, look, my book sold 700,000 copies. And it's like, well, like maybe, but it didn't really like sell that many copies. You just like gave it away for free, basically. Yeah. So, so that doesn't really happen. I don't think as much anymore. Um, but there, there are some more sophisticated and um, reputable, um, we call them hybrid publishers um, these days where Essentially, the difference between a hybrid publisher and a traditional publisher is that with hybrid publishing, the author will retain some more, if not all of their rights. Whereas when um, a book was published at the publishing house, you know, it becomes the kind of, um, it's the publishing house's 
kind of property. Like you, you maintain, of course, the copyright, but um, you know the the finances and all of that kind of go through um, different uh, funnels. So with a hybrid publisher, more of the rights will be maintained. There's a little bit more author agency, but depending on the group that you work with, there's some editorial input, there's some design input, there's some sales and marketing and distribution. So you don't have to do quite all of the heavy lifting yourself as an author with that. Um, but with both self-publishing and hybrid publishing, there's usually a financial investment that needs to go into play that the author needs to pay money in order to basically hire the service um, and get the service. But with traditional publishing, the, the author very rarely has to um, lay out money, at least to the publisher. They might make an investment for, you know, uh, extra promotional assistance or things like that. But um, the author doesn't need to, to pay to have their book published, um, which is uh, usually what's happening with the other um, with the other models. How do you know when you're finished editing a piece? <laughs> Never. Never. That's true. That's the answer. Like Never. both. Both you yourself a stop. It's like a war of attrition, right? After a while, you're both just like, okay, we're done. <laughs> and oftentimes, like the things that you pick up on or that you're obsessing over, you just let go. Yeah, you're just you're just tired. And yeah. if you do leave it and like give it some rest, you're like, okay, that's not actually not too bad, right? <laughs> um, that's very true. Um, do you, as an editor and now a writer, do you have advice for people with finished manuscripts? Um, well, I think if you have a finished manuscript, um, you should very first ask yourself, um, you know, what do you want to do with it? Because there is an expectation, I think, that if you are writing something that you need to like be a writer and like get published, but you don't really need to. Um, there's no writer police that says that you have to go through this process. <laughs> so there, there, you know, think about the investment that you're going to make in your book. It's going to be at least a year. If you had Wakey's fairy tale story where, you know, everything kind of lines up right from the beginning, you're going to have at least a year of the editorial and publishing process to go through. Um, if you're the average person, including like myself, um, you have multiple years of, of working on a project um, while it's being written, while it's being edited, while you're looking for agents. So it is a time commitment. Um, so you want to make sure that you have that time and that energy. Um, if you're working another job or have the family that you need to take care of or things like that, you just have to give yourself a realistic expectation for how long this is going to take um, and give yourself that time. Um, when you're going to the first step of looking for an agent, the, the best way to go about it is to actually look at books that you like or books that um, you think are similar to yours. So I don't mean like, I think my book is similar to um, The Great Gatsby. <laughs> or, um, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to use his agent. Pride and Prejudice, War and Peace, like not those kinds of books, like books that are, um, you know, have been published within five years that have a kind of contemporary resonance to them. Um, and then go ahead and just look in the acknowledgments and there you'll see um, the agent and the editor likely uh, knock on wood if they had a good relationship and they feel like they have a reason to acknowledge them and say thank you. Um, so that's where you're going to find, um, information about who agents are. There are a lot of online resources right now that, um, can provide you some general information, but it can be hard to navigate through that and, and weed out like what's actually useful. So that's, that's the best, um, that's a really you. good point. Um, and I actually used that when I was, um, going into publishing because I would look at the books that I liked and go to the acknowledgments and see who the editors were and, you know, who were the publishers. And that's how I developed this um, sense of like where I might want to work because they published the kind of books that I liked. Yeah. And it was also how I got my connections with through teachers, but these teachers I also admired. Right. And where I, you know, when I first started publishing short stories, I would go to writers that 
I admired and um, find kind of like the where they publish and then go from there. Um, okay, so we'll um, wrap up. There's two questions that I'll just quickly answer. Um, one question was about in fiction writing, does it ever involve a character that's very different from you that you're not familiar with or through research? And how do you how do writers deal with writer characters who are different from you? I think I answer this a lot in my class, so maybe I'll just take a stab at it. I generally find that if a writer is trying to write a character very different from them, there's a motivation or a reason. And the writer just needs to ask themselves why they are doing it. And that reason needs to sort of be well thought of. Um, and that's why the research. I generally find if the reason is not very good and it's sort of just, I wanted to write somebody different, that's not a good enough reason to motivate a piece, you know? Um, or like totally different, right? Um, so I'm always, you know, this happens in my class. I just always am asking students, why are you writing from this perspective? Um, and what is the motivation behind it? Um, and it, it, usually, you know, to be honest, if anything is done well, it you can get away with it. <laughs> that's sort of the rule of writing for a lot of things. Um, but, but that's kind of a, the big question that a lot of people are asking anyway. Um, okay, so I think that's kind of, I try to answer all the questions um, and hopefully yeah. I've succeeded. Um, Jennifer, thank you for your time. Um, do you <laughs> feel like there is um, any, any last words you want to leave our viewers about publishing or just your writing experience or your trajectory from publishing to writing now? Yeah, well, um, thank you for all of these great questions, everybody, and for the chance to talk about this book. It was a, um, a really great opportunity to go back down memory lane. And this in this case, is a galley. No, this is Wakey's book, the cover. Um, and this is a, a bound galley and early copy that but, I just- no, This is like actually what, all the, this is actually what all the reviewers read, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So like, it's actually, I actually had a nervous break because I was like, oh, if I'm going to correct that, how do the reviewers, they're never going to read the real thing. But, but it's very similar by that. By the time it's a galley, it's like so similar that it doesn't. Yes. Yes. So um, I will just say to close that um, I think my website um, will be shared with all of you. If you ever have questions, you're welcome to reach out for me with to me there. Um, as mentioned, you're going to get so many questions. Jennifer. Yeah, I, I'm no longer actively editing um, at a publishing house, so I can't get you in, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and I can't buy your book, but um, I'm always happy to chat with people about this. Um, and like Vicky mentioned, I am on the writing side now working on a cookbook and some other things. So if you're interested in any of that, you can find out that information on my website. But again, I'm just happy to talk about this because I, I love stories in all forms. You love stories. Um, and likewise, you know, following up with Jennifer, um, I think my email is also on the pen page. Feel free to ask me questions about the process. I think I try to answer as much as I can, but um, you know, it's actually, it's actually not a science. It sounds like editing is more of a science than writing is something. It is. Yes. Everyone just needs to, um, I think it's a good, good um, advice for everything right now. Um, think less about it. Just, yes. No, you're good. You're that's a good point. Because it's actually don't the think so much about it. No, no, right. The simpler solution is better. Yes. Yeah. And that's what you know, you yeah. It's like I think sometimes when I work with Robin, I'm like, I'm just talking to Jennifer all over again. <laughs> I miss you. Oh, I miss you too. Yeah. Um, hopefully we can get together sometime. That yes. Is. Hopefully everyone will be able to be back in close quarters again soon but um stay safe in the meantime and everyone else who's watching um thank you so much for joining us and thank you to Penn for for hosting this um it's really great to have such wonderful support for for literature continuing to hold up during this time yeah um and thank you everyone keep writing your novels it's hard but it's really worthwhile um and please just send if any questions i didn't answer please just send me an email i'm happy to respond all right bye, bye. <laughs>